Okay, uh, I thought I could make uh, one more video about uh, the energy loss associated with removing uh, intermediates in the TCA cycle. So um, in our discussion worksheet, we talked about alpha ketoglutarate being removed to form glutamate, or you could remove oxaloacetate to form aspartate. And there's other examples which we don't cover in this class. Um, but the idea here is that you can remove a lot of the uh, the TCA cycle itself is kind of amphibolic, so it can it and what amphibolic means it's both catabolic and anabolic. So we can, of course, as we're going through the TCA cycle, we're oxidizing our carbons and we're storing that energy in the form of electrons in NADH, FADH2, and we're also making GTP. And all of these things can later go uh, FADH2 and NADH can later on go to the electron transport chain, and we can. Uh, basically harness the energy from those electrons. And we'll talk about this next week, but we're gonna generate ATP using all of this energy. So as we're oxidizing the carbons, you guys should think that we're trying to generate an ATP, okay? Now, the idea here is that, again, we're saying that it's amphibolic because instead of oxidizing the carbons, some of the intermediates in the TCA cycle, what we can do is we can remove them to form larger molecules. So we can take, I don't know, uh, for example, one is like citrate to make fatty acids, okay? Um, so the idea here is that you can remove different intermediates in the TCA cycle and form larger structures, okay? And that's why, and that's like an anabolic pathway, okay? Now, the idea here is that when you're removing this, these intermediates, you're going to have an energy cost associated with removing those intermediates, okay? There's two, and we can break this down into this formula, um, and the formula is the total ATP loss is equal to the removal loss plus the replenishment loss. Now, it's it, the removal, I, I like to think that the removal loss is a little bit more straightforward and that's like the one that everyone can see and they understand. It's the replenishment loss that of, of some people have a little bit of a hard time understanding, but we're gonna go through both right now, okay? So again, when we say that we have a removal loss, what we're saying is that we're gonna, let me get this, we're gonna, have a loss of the rest of the TCA cycle. Okay, and what do I mean by this, okay? So let's just think about it like this. Let's say I'm removing uh, citrate to make, or you know what, let's just go alpha ketoglutarate to form glutamate, okay? So we're just gonna remove this to form glutamate, okay? So if we have alpha ketoglutarate and we're forming glutamate, I want you guys to ask yourself, okay, well, if we're going through the TCA cycle, we go through this step, we can go through a conotase, we can go through isocitrate dehydrogenase, and we very good, we make one of our NADHs, very, very good. But then notice how when I remove alpha ketoglutarate to form glutamate, can I go through the rest of the cycle? Well, you're going to say, well, no, I just removed the intermediate, so I'm not going to be able to go through the rest of the cycle. And that's exactly what the removal loss is accounting for. We lost the rest of the cycle, meaning that I didn't have the opportunity to make this NADH over here. I didn't have the opportunity to make the GTP over here or the FADH2 or this other NADH, okay? So what we're gonna say over here is if we're trying to account for the energy loss associated with removing alpha ketoglutarate, the first part of this loss is the removal loss. So all I'm gonna do over here is I'm gonna tally it up. So we're gonna say that, well, we had two NADHs, okay? We had one GTP that we lost out on, and we had one FADH2. And we're gonna cover next week how many ATP each, uh, why every NADH is worth uh, 2.5 ATP and stuff like that. But for now, just understand the reasoning, and um, it, or just you just have to know this that what every NADH uh, is gonna be 2.5 ATP. So because we have two of them, it's gonna be two times 2.5 ATP for every NADH. Okay, so it's going to be 5 ATP for 2 NADH. And again, we're going to talk about this next week, why it's 2.5 and what, where the difference in the values comes, okay? Um, we got 1 GTP, so 1 GTP can be converted to 1 ATP, so it's 1 times 1, so it's going to be 1 ATP. And then 1 FADH2, every FADH2, because and we only have one of them, every FADH2 is going to be worth 1.5 ATP. So in total, we have... So what do we have? 5 plus 1.5 plus 1 is 7.5. So the removal loss associated with removing uh, alpha ketoglutarate to form glutamate is 7.5 ATP.
okay? Now, this, ver this number could very easily be a different number depending on what I'm removing, right? Because if you think about it, let's say instead of removing uh, alpha ketoglutarate, let's say I removed citrate. So let's just say I remove this intermediate. Well, now I don't go through the entire TCA cycle, right? So now I also have to count for this additional NADH, right? So now it's the NADH, this NADH, this GTP, this FADH2, this NADH. So now I'm missing out on three NADHs, one GTP and one FADH2. So if I remove citrate, that will be 10 ATP that I'm going to lose out on. So, and that's why I say that it varies between zero and 10 because the maximum amount of ATP that you're going to lose is obviously if you remove an intermediate from the beginning of the TCA cycle because that means that you didn't have the opportunity to get energy, any energy from those carbons by oxidizing them, okay? So it could be a maximum of 10 ATP if you remove citrate. And alternatively, let's say we remove something at the end of the TCA cycle, okay? And I know you're going to say there's no technically real end because um, it's a cycle and it, there's no, like, end to a cycle. It's just, it loops. But when we talk about the beginning and the end, we typically say that the beginning of the cycle starts to citrate, and then the end of the cycle is at... Uh, oxaloacetate and we're repeating that cycle going from citrate to oxaloacetate in a cyclical fashion okay so now i'm going to say well let's just say i removed oxaloacetate well if i remove oxaloacetate we're going to again start off from the beginning well notice how our citrate molecule can go to isocitrate alpha ketoglutarate succinyl coa succinate fumarate all the way to oxaloacetate so and in every one of these steps we made our nadh we made our gtp we made our fadh2 and we made our other nadh so did I, if I removed, so let's say I removed oxaloacetate. So let's just say I removed it. Did I, do I really have a removal loss associated with removing oxaloacetate? Well, you're going to say, well, no, because we already went through all the steps and we oxidized uh, all the carbons that we could have in that one cycle. And we got all the NADHs, GTPs, and FADH2s that we could have gotten. So we're not going to have a removal loss associated with this because it's already at the end of the cycle, okay? So that's the idea here is that the removal loss depends on what you're removing, and that's why it varies between zero and 10. 10 is the maximum, and it, that's if you remove something from the beginning, okay? So I'll just make an example. It doesn't necessarily have to be citrate, but we could just say citrate. And then zero could be if we're removing oxaloacetate. But in this case that I, uh, in the example that I was showing you guys right over here, okay, so in the example that we're doing over here, uh, we're going to be removing alpha ketoglutarate to form glutamate. Is it, that's like the one I just threw out. So we're going to go glutamate over here. Okay. So that's the straightforward one. The removal loss, you lose the rest of the cycle. Everyone seems to get that. Now we also, there's going to be an additional loss that we have to account for. And this is the replenishment loss. Okay. Now, when we say the replenishment loss, we're going to say that this is to replenish oxaloacetate. Okay. So the replenishment loss is to replenish oxaloacetate. And now you might ask yourself, well, why do we even have this loss? We already accounted for the loss. We, we already accounted for the loss of the rest of the cycle. We shouldn't even need to account for anything else. We're done. But I want you guys to think about it like this. So remember, when we were doing our carbon tracing problems, we took this two carbon acetyl CoA and combined it with the four carbon oxaloacetate to form the six carbon citrate. And that we needed acetyl CoA and oxaloacetate to form every citrate molecule to start every new cycle, right? Because acetyl-CoA and an oxaloacetate are basically our starting materials for the next cycle. Now, let me ask you guys this question. Well, if we removed alpha-ketoglutarate to form glutamate, so we remove this molecule from the TCA cycle, do I get to go through the rest of the TCA cycle? Well, you're gonna say, no, I just removed it, so I'm not gonna go through the rest of the cycle. So do I ever form oxaloacetate? And you're gonna say, well, no, I'm not forming oxaloacetate. And if I don't have oxaloacetate, could I start the next cycle? Because remember, we need acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate to start every cycle. So if, I'm not make, if I remove something and I don't make oxaloacetate, can I start a new cycle? No, you're not going to be able to. So that's where the replenishment cost comes in. Because it is necessary for us to regenerate oxaloacetate. Otherwise, the TCA cycle will shut down. Okay. So now you're going to say, well, okay, so now we understand that we need that oxaloacetate to start a new cycle. And how do we do this? Well, if you remember from a previous video, we said that in order, our body has an enzyme that can directly convert from, it can directly convert from pyruvate directly to oxaloacetate. Remember, this enzyme was pyruvate carboxylase, okay? 
and it was using ATP energy with a ligase. Okay? It's going to use ATP energy. And we talked about in the previous video exactly how you can trace the carbons with this. So um, in case you're not seeing exactly what's going on, you can go and check out that video. But the idea here is that we're adding this carboxyl group to the methyl end of pyruvate, and then we're making it, so it's going to be right over here. And then we're basically um, adding that extra carbon, and we're directly going from pyruvate to oxalic state, so we can skip over this entire cycle. And this is very, very useful for us because now we have a way of directly making oxaloacetate so that if we're running short on oxaloacetate, what we can do is we can directly create some more oxaloacetate so we can start another cycle and keep the central metabolic pathway or the TCA cycle running, okay? So the idea here is that the replenishment loss, it's so that we can regenerate oxaloacetate so that the TCA cycle won't shut, shut down. And the way that we do this is through the pyruvate carboxylase reaction, which directly converts pyruvate to oxaloacetate. Now, the energy cost associated with this is always 13.5 ATP to replenish the oxaloacetate. And I'll explain why it's always 13.5 ATP. The reason why it's 13.5 ATP, it's going to be, the first part's going to, number one's going to be straightforward. Number two and three are going to have to think about it for a little bit, okay? So number one, obviously, if I'm going directly from pyruvate to oxaloacetate, notice how, again, pyruvate carboxylase uses 1 ATP. So that's this 1 ATP over here. We needed to use that 1 ATP so that we can put that bicarbonate molecule onto the methyl end of pyruvate, and we can carboxylate that pyruvate so we can form oxaloacetate. Now what we got to do is we're, we're going to have this number two and three that we have to account for. And this is where the logic or the reasoning comes into play. Well, let's think about it. That pyruvate molecule we just took, we just directly converted to oxaloacetate because we didn't have any oxaloacetate and we wanted to make more of it so we can start another cycle. But let's just say hypothetically we had enough oxaloacetate. If we had enough oxaloacetate, would we want to go through pyruvate carboxylase? No, we already have enough oxaloacetate, so there's no point in making more oxaloacetate. So the idea here is that we're, we're going to basically say, well, under normal conditions, this pyruvate molecule could have instead went through the long way to form oxaloacetate, right? It could have went through, I don't know why I did that. It could have, in what it could have done is it could have gone through pyruvate dehydrogenase, and it could have been oxidized there, and we could have gone one NADH, and it could have gone through an entire TCA cycle and we could have made NADHs, FADH2s, and GTP, or this amount to be exact, and that could have been 10 ATP right over there. But because we're directly converting the pyruvate to the oxaloacetate molecule, that pyruvate molecule no longer can, it, it no longer has the opportunity to go through pyruvate dehydrogenase and no longer has the opportunity to go through the TCA cycle. So we're effectively skipping PDH, so we have to account for the energy loss associated there. And we also have to account for skipping one TCA cycle, which is another 10 ATP. So in this case, that's going to be 13.5 ATP total. And again, this is always going to be the case. No matter where I remove from the TCA cycle, the replenishment loss is always 13.5 ATP because you always need to go through these three steps in order to replenish oxaloacetate. Okay. So now you might ask yourself this one question. Okay. You're going to say, well, if it costs this much, why would we ever even need to do that? Well, you're going to say like, why, why would we want to, why would pyruvate ever want to go and make oxaloacetate? We, um, it costs 13.5 ATP and energy is pretty like scarce. Like we don't want to waste energy when we don't have to. But if you think about it, we already said that a lot of the, what we're doing here, it's, it's, it's important here that to regenerate oxaloacetate, otherwise the TCA cycle will shut down. Okay. So I know it, it's, it costs a little bit of energy up front. So 13.5 ATP is a little bit of energy, but you can think of it that we're going to sacrifice that little bit of energy so we can make the oxaloacetate molecule. Okay. And because now we're making oxaloacetate, we can now restart the TCA cycle because then now we can use that oxaloacetate to combine with acetyl-CoA and we can go through the TCA cycle and make more energy. So it's making a little bit of a sacrifice up front so that you can later on reap the benefits. Kind of like how you guys are going to school right now and it's for some people it's not that fun and you're sacrificing a little bit now, but later on you're going to reap the benefits uh, with hopefully having a better job or some profession that you really like, okay? But that's the idea behind the replenishment loss. And now what we're going to do again is we're going to say that the total loss, so if we wanted to write out the total loss in this case, so the total loss, again, is going to be the replenishment loss, or not, let's just go in order. 
it's going to be the removal loss plus the replenishment loss. So removal loss plus the replenishment loss. And in this case, we said that our removal loss was 7.5. And again, this can vary depending on what you remove. And the replenishment loss, that's always going to be 13.5 ATP. So in total, it's going to be 21. It's going to be adding 21 ATP. Okay.